Adi, on the punt block, I mean, do you, is that just the way that goes sometimes? It's a, it's a game of inches, and he, if you don't get it, that's the risk? There's a lot of if ands and you know, buts when it comes to that play. Ideally, it starts with me as a coach, continue to work on our fundamentals and our techniques when it comes to being in those positions. Um, understanding the down and di the distance, and we don't, we don't want to run into the punter. And Ade wasn't trying to run into the punter; he's trying to make a play. But those things, when you land, don't give opportunity for the punter to land, those penalties are going to get called. And we got to do a better job, starting with myself, putting our players in better positions to go make those plays when we're in those positions. So you know, Ade's been working his butt off. He's been great for us on teams and on on defense and continues to get better. And we're just looking to put ourselves in a position to help our team on offense with the field position. Uh, uh, Steven Sims and that kickoff return unit, uh, mm -hmm. what challenges do they uh, pose y'all this week? You know, Steven Sims, dual returner, dynamic coming out of Kansas, played at Washington. He started his career with Washington, um, did, a really, did a really good job. Actually, he did a great job for these guys um, in the preseason. For, uh, he had a really big return versus Seattle, I believe, on punt return. He's very dynamic with the ball in his hands. He's always looking to improvise and get to the edges, and he's fearless getting north-south with the football. So it's a great challenge when it comes to going against Sims because he does a good job of flipping the field for their offense and putting their offense in really good field position. I'm writing something about uh, McCullough. Um, and I'm curious – uh, why did y'all sign him? What did you see in him that you thought he would be a good fit uh, at long snapper? You know, his opportunity, his, his ability to snap the ball, his snap velocity, uh, location, athletic ability, uh, his attitude, his mindset when it comes to playing the game. We look at, in our special teams room, we look at guys that are athletes that snap, hold, punt, kick. And he, was, he fit those characteristics when we talk about athletic ability, his mindset, a snap velocity, snap location, and all those things came into play. And he's done a great job for us this year, and he continues to get better each and every week with his reps. He said that his goal is to never be noticed. Do you, do you never notice him? I don't want to say I never <laughs> notice him. There's only so many guys in the specialist room. I wouldn't say that. Um, but it, that job, when you're a snapper in the NFL, there's only 32 of them, and sometimes people don't notice what you're doing until something happens right. when it comes. So when it comes to his position, yeah, you try not to be noticed, and it's uh, underappreciated the job that that snappers do in the NFL until something bad happens. And we really appreciate the work that he puts in each and every day to help our units out. This is a big pic big picture question. It may be a little odd, but. When it comes to the return game and the schemes, mm -hmm. the return game, is there anything new left out there? I mean, do you spend any time in the offseason looking at 1930s film, try, or trying to come up with something that hasn't been done, or is it just a matter of, you know, everything that could have been tried has been tried. We just need to perfect three or four things. There is. I mean, history – does repeat itself, and we do look back at various tapes. Now the rules have changed on punt return and kickoff return, so we had to adapt to the rules. But when you talk about fundamentals and you know our technique, those it goes back to when football was you know invented when it comes to those basic fundamentals. So we look at a lot of you know different ways to put our players in positions to win their blocks when it, we talk about you know kickoff return or punt return and we do a lot of studies on what helps the returner whether how much space can we give them when the ball is caught and then the evolution of the kicker how strong and how accurate kickers are and punters are that kind of changes the mindset on how to do different things i know used to look back um when i first started coaching a couple like in the nfl or even in college if you put pressure on a punter uh, sometimes you can force a bad kick now there's times, too, based on the type of punter you're going against, if a punter sees that both their gunners are double press, now they're in their head, they're like, oh, I have to hit the best ball. And sometimes that's when they hit their worst ball because they have to flip the field. So each and every week we look at different things. We look at one type of punter we're going against when we talk about the evolution of the game and various studies. And then we look at how teams cover because people cover different types of ways, whether they're using their PP as a third gunner or they're using their slots or wings as a, a faster cover player. So those things come into play, and it's week by week. They're kind of like week by week studies for us in season. And then going back to off season, we look at various things on how we can help our return, our return team gain first downs. And I know you heard me talk about that before, whether it's on kickoff return, touchback is at the 25. So can we get the ball to the 35 in a return? Pump return. 
10 yards, 10 or more yards. The more first downs we could, you know, get in the return game, the, it puts our offense in better position to put points on the board. So we try to look at those little things and, you know, kickoff return. It, the game has changed so much on kickoff return, no wedge blocking. When I first got in the NFL, you could wedge block. And now you don't have that, and now you have to keep eight guys up front. So now we talk about double teams and wedge blocks. There's less and less because of the rules. Because you're dealing with so much open space with soccer in terms of you're talking about putting your guys in the best position to block in terms of everybody, you know, moving as one unit across 50 yards. Yes. Do, there you, is, do you ever look at? I, I, I don't necessarily look at soccer, but it's funny because just watching soccer the last couple of days, right. just watching how the spacing of how they operate and how they I look more so how they defend. I look at the space and how they defend. But when we talk about um, kickoff return, I look at it as a run play. So, you know, on our offense, there will be times where we're one block away from popping a big run on offense, but they're second down. So you could, you have a couple more downs that are on that drive to get that. On kickoff return, it's that one down, and you might get one opportunity for the rest of that, that game. So the importance, everything's magnified on the kickoff return plan when it comes to that. But we do look at how we can get guys in proper positions to win their play side number. And then also to our, our blockers, it's really hard because let's say you're covering downfield and I'm blocking for CP and we're running the return to the right. I got to have a picture of understanding behind me what CP is trying to do, how he's trying to set up the block. Where do I need to be? How the guy? How are you going to cover me? Are you going to try to get straight to the bar? Are you going to try to shake me in woman's speed and go back door? So it may look on a piece of paper, hey, you got to block him. But there's how are you doing it and why do we want to do it that way? So we spend a lot of time on how and why with our players, with the spacing and understanding that. Thank right. you. you guys take care. Appreciate it. Drake London, um, his usage or his usage in the past game has been down. Do you, for a rookie, give him, for lack of a better word, word a pep talk, or do you feel like if he needs a pep talk, he's not the guy you thought he was? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, you know, especially in this business, young player, not young player, I think a lot of guys um, understand the – mentality in which they go in each game and especially at certain positions right there's opportunities especially at the wide out spot where you know your number could be called and again for whatever reason right you don't get a chance to to have a chance to make a play uh, when it comes to drake or any of our young players i think they all have approached otas training camp and the regular season the right way i mean they've got a great professionalism about them uh, they understand that it's a team game and so when you look at the makeup of the young players that we have um they understand that at the end of the day, it's about trying to score and trying to win. And however they can help us to do that, they will. Um, but in terms of any of that, you know, talking to a guy or, you know, I don't think that's needed. I think it's more about the fact of understanding your role. And then obviously us as coaches, right, doing a good job of trying to get each of our players right, a chance to show what they can do. Drake or any of the young players or any of the players on the roster offensively. What are your reflections on just how well the team was able to run the ball against Washington that obviously has such a stout defensive front with those two defensive tackles in particular? Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to the fact of you know, going into that week, right, no, no different than going into this week, um, you know the challenges I had. Everybody watches the same film. It's not like we have a different film as coaches and the players have. Uh, but I think what you see is um, we have an intent in which we like to play football. The guys understand it and our ability to play with a certain speed off the ball, regardless of its run or pass, I think starts pre-practice all the way through practice. And I think more importantly, um, guys have a belief in what we're doing and they play fast because they're thinking less because they understand what we're trying to accomplish. And usually at this level, less thinking equals faster play, which means you can typically get an advantage. Now, again, right, there was things that Washington presented us uh, that caused issues for sure no different than um, this opponent this week. Um, but for us, right, it's allowing our players to think less and play faster. And hopefully that, that ends in good results for us. Arthur's made a couple of comments, and I think you have too. But essentially, you know, all this scheme stuff is a little overrated. We could give them our playbook. We could take their playbook. It wouldn't make a ton of difference because it's more about 
how and when it's done. How literal is that? Yeah, I think some of that is, you know, I think every good offense I've been a part of has tendencies, right? You have, there's things that you do that you do well. The teams know that. They obviously prepare for it. It's our job to um, dress it up or give a wrinkle. But the reality is when you see these good offenses or good teams, uh, you typically know what they're going to do. They might, you, know, you might not know exactly when they're doing it, but you know it's coming because that's what they hold their hat on. Um, but for us, it, it really does come down to the fact of our ability to, to trust our fundamentals and our execution. And we try to prepare the players each week for as many different p potential outcomes of looks they can get. We, if we feel we do that, right, then the, te the pre-test is going to be harder than the actual test. And so that's the goal of the coaches, position coaches and myself, is to prepare these guys going into the week on Sunday that what they faced in practice will be as hard or harder than what they're going to see on Sunday. And again, is it always successful that way? Sometimes, right, they have different things they show you that they've never shown you before. But there's also times where, as a coach, that's a rewarding part of it, where you feel as a teacher, you prepared your student or your player here, right, where he's got the answer when he sees what's coming. And then you see guys play fast and guys react, and then all of a sudden their instincts take over. Um, you can't prepare for everything. This is the National Football League. There's some really, really great smart coaches all around this league, and there's smart players. And again, they devote their whole week to it. So we still try to give them the best way to make this week in terms of preparation hard for them. So that when the game comes, it's easier. Um, some weeks obviously are more successful than others. without going back to that last offensive play uh, in Washington, just because there's been a lot of you know, talk about it. When you go back and look at the film of that play, mm -hmm. is there something that the players can do to better execute that play, or is it just one of those things where you know, Lindstrom can't do anything about Duran and getting his hand yeah, in that passing lane? You know, being in this league and being around it more than around half my life, like, tip balls happen. Um, again, when you look at play design, regardless of when, uh, you ask yourself as coaches, are you putting your players in the best position? Uh, were you able to at least schematically give yourself a chance? Um, and then there's variables, right? It's, it's, it's no different than the play in that drive in which Marcus play actions slips at the top of his drop, avoids a potential sack, and then you get a huge, huge play. That's a variable. At no point are we practicing Marcus outside. Hey, Marcus, fall down, get to a knee, don't get touched, get yourself back up and throw that ball, right? So there's variables in which you can never account for. We understand that. That's the hard part about coaching, right? As much as you want to control the environment, the reality is there's very little at times in those circumstances, right? That ball could have bounced any other way. Conversations, narratives could be completely different. But as coaches, right, as players, same thing, we all do introspective after games and you self-evaluate and you go into any of those play designs, regardless if it's the last play or the first play or the third play. And you ask yourself, did we give the players an advantage? Was design good enough? And what did the defense do that presented problems for us? Because of whatever they did, we're going to see again. Um, but yeah, when you throw the football in the net, in, at any level, but especially in the NFL, right, there, there's things within or without of your control. And you have to accept that. And unfortunately for us, right, there was a ball that got tipped and it, and it went the direction of the commanders and, and that's how it went. But in terms of design and how we felt about the play and were the players doing exactly what we asked and did we think we were gonna get that defensive structure? Yeah, some of that played into our favor, but obviously not the end result. Player hat back on a little bit and explain what it's like. You sure you want that? You don't. Oh, I do. No, you those are some of my favorite. No answers. one wants to see that. What it's like in an NFL pocket on the play? What, what that space or lack of space? Yeah, I think that's. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody really describe it in any way that can really help anybody who's never been in it. It's an un. It's a feeling in which you you can't mimic. That's the hardest part about why I think. You get college quarterbacks that come in here who have really good in college football. And they get to the NFL and they're like, ah, they didn't have the same career. What will, did you guys miss in the evaluation? The hardest thing to mimic is an NFL pocket. You watch some college football and high school football and these guys can hitch, hitch, hitch. And, and all of a sudden, you know, they get through progressions 
and things of that nature. And then you get to the NFL, it's like, oh, he can't get through a progression. Well, most pockets, I, mean, I think there was a study I did a few years ago that I had saw and did some of my own that almost 40% of the pockets are what we deem dirty, which means there's something at your feet, you're getting hit after you throw. And I think that is the hardest thing for anybody to translate. When you see it in college, you get to pro, and then an NFL quarterback gets in here. And there's things constantly around you. But it's an unnatural thing, right? So as a kid, you probably grew up and played tag or something like that, right? So anybody's coming after you, what do you what's your natural reaction? And to look at them. And then get out of there. But in the pocket, if you look at them, you take your eyes off the coverage and the receivers, and now, right, the defense has you. They know you're looking down at the rush, and you're basically toast. So you're trying to, to fix someone's eyes and their natural reaction, right, which is keep your head up, move, feel. And that's why when you see some of the greats, literally the pocket passers that have lasted in this league, the uncanny sense of their ability to move in just the right amount of space and keep their eyes down the field is why I think what separates guys who can play in this league for 10, 15 years and guys that can never make it. And it's, it's as much as a potentially learned trait as it is just a natural feel. Because we talked about this a few weeks ago. Like the hardest thing about pocket presence is this. When you're a young quarterback and you're really athletic and someone's coming at you, what's your first natural reaction? Well, you're probably faster than everybody else on the field. You're probably the best athlete. So your natural reaction or your instinct is to go. But when you grow up and you, that, you can't do that because you're, you're not as fast as everybody else and you're maybe the slowest guy in the field, right? Then what do you learn to do? You learn to play in that pocket because you know you can't survive outside of it. And so I think at times when you bring in guys or what a pocket feels like, there's a lot of natural feel, but there's some of those things where you have to basically, you have to make a decision with yourself that's going to say, I'm going to stay in here to the very last second, even though I know I'm going to get hit. And I'm going to deliver this football because that's my job requirement. In the same token, right, you still want that player to be able to take off if needed. So you're, you're walking the tightrope. But in terms of what that pocket feels like, I've never been around another contraption, drill. We've done BR in other places I've been. Yeah. And nothing, I mean nothing. It, it's a surreal feeling also, right? You drop back and there's 70,000 people. And then you hear nothing. Yeah, some of your sense, like right? Some of your senses go, you know, right? You, other senses you lean on, right? So now, all of a sudden, where you would trust, maybe your hearing and other things, well, those go away, right? Because now, all of a sudden, your focus is on something completely else that's different. So, again, I think when you watch quarterbacks that have natural pocket presence, it's something that probably that. It's a certain sense they have. Guys who, and I've unfortunately been around, and I was probably one included. Thanks for bringing up my playing. But the, I won't be able to sleep tonight. Um, man, I the, now I'm just thinking like, if I had pocket presence, I would, I'd probably be on a beach in the Bahamas retired here. But because I didn't have pocket presence, I'm up here answering questions about pocket presence. When you scout college quarterbacks, is that something? I think that's a hard. Do benefit of the doubt to the players that maybe are behind bad offensive lines who sure. maybe don't have the stats? Like, well, I think you know, you you look at some. That's a great question because there's some, like there's some dominant teams in college football that maybe play less. You know, the opponent isn't as good as them, right? So you go back there, and these quarterbacks have what I call really unrealistic time. Because you get here, it's just like the reality is, and that's why when you see quarterbacks play fast at a young age at this level, like that is that does attract you when you watch it on film. You're like, hey, this kid's got it. When the kid's got to take an extra hitch or he's got to move too much, you're like, it's going to take some time. I'm not saying you can't eventually get there, but there's for sure. Like when you're in college, man, there's sometimes it's just seven on seven back there. And other times you got other programs that maybe don't have those dominant guys up front, and it becomes an issue. But I also think this, like, there, and again, I'm talking out both sides of my mouth, which I normally do up here. There's a fun, no doubt, right? You can never pin me down like, hey, Rags did this, but he said this. I can't use anything that he does, which is typical. This is my goal when I walk out. So, but there is a fine line though, right? Of, well, yeah, quarterback stays in there. Quarterback stays in there. Man, he's taking hits. He's taking hits. And then every quarterback has a clock and every clock can be broken. So there is a fine line of, hey, my man, like we can't be taking as many hits because eventually, right? What happens when a quarterback gets hits too much? 
where that ball starts spitting out really fast. And now there's nothing developing. And so there is a fine line of all that. When you're uh, just switching to the game, uh, when you're facing two linebackers, uh, outside linebackers like the Seavers have, that can really get up the field and then cut back yeah. in, how does that affect the, the RPO portion of this game? Yeah, I think, you know, you look at this team in particular and how they're built and how they've been built really for a long period of time, um, regardless of who's been the caller there defensively. Um, it's amazing to see the longevity of a place. I grew up in Cleveland, right? The Pittsburgh obviously being a rival as a kid and watching, what, three head coaches in how many years? And um, and so you just you see the style of play. You see the players that they drafted, the players they sign, and you have the utmost respect for that organization um, in terms of how they do their business. And then you look at that defense, and it's just a certain style of play in which, you know, I haven't been the AFC in a long time. I think the last time we played them in, in my coaching career was about five or six years ago. And um, and a lot hasn't changed. This the intent in which they play and how they play. Some of the players obviously obviously have changed, right? But those – and then you look at how they played certain teams, right, within the division. They obviously have um, some great quarterbacks uh, within that division. You see how they play them. And so uh, there is no um, – we are under the, in, the impression that they'll have a plan on how they're going to play the quarterback. Um, we know they're going to be well coached, and we know that – uh, we're going to have to do our best um, to try to keep them off balance. Uh, but we know that they have, uh, within their toolbox of defensive of tactics, they have every pitch, and just we have to be ready for it. Uh, I want to ask you about these, these rookie edge rushers who have been getting you know, more and more incorporated into the defense, Arnold, Arnold and Katie Arnold. and D'Angelo, just what you've seen from them and their progression so far. Getting better each week. I mean, they you know, started out slow, a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff, new stuff to learn. I think they've uh, progressed in the fact they're playing faster because they're understanding more. So the longer you're around, the more you understand, the faster you're going to play. When you're sitting there thinking all the time because you're not really sure, uh, you don't usually play too fast. So uh, I think they're progressing very well for rookies. Uh, Kenny Pickett hasn't had a turnover, I think, in the past three games. Is it a matter of him just getting the experience? Have, have you noticed have the Steelers kind of simplified things a little bit more? within their scheme or, or? No, I don't think they simplify things at all. I mean, if you watch the first part of the season and it's Trubisky and then now you watch here, uh, you see the same route tree, you see the same plays, you see the same pretty much everything. I don't think they've changed a whole lot. I mean, they could have changed some things. I don't know. You know, I'm not in their meeting, so I don't know that. But I'm not, I don't think that's the case. I think the guy's just gaining experience, getting feeling more comfortable back there. It's like anything else, just like you guys asked me about the outside backers. I mean, the more you play, the, the better you feel, the faster you play, because I've seen it now a little bit. Um, but I, I think it's just him gaining experience. When you look at that offense, just what are, in general, the biggest challenges that they present to you guys on Sunday? Well, first of all, they're a good, run, they're a good running team. They get, two, they get good backs. Uh, they run hard. Um, you know, similar, I think, to a little bit to last week. Uh, with Washington, they're similar type guys, not just because they both went to Alabama, but because, I mean, they're similar type guys, hard runners. Um, and then the other thing is they do a lot formationally, and they got good receivers. To me, they're very similar in a lot of ways, not schematically necessarily to Washington, but I thought Washington had a couple of really good wide receivers, had good running backs, had a good scheme, a lot of motion, a lot of different things. And I think uh, the Steelers are similar in, in some ways to that. Not necessarily the exact same scheme. I'm just saying personnel-wise and stuff, I think they're good. And get good, two good young quarterbacks. Uh, getting AJ back, you know, you've had him now for a couple weeks now. Um, but how, how does he change what you're able – what this defense is basically able to well, do? Well, I, th I don't know that he's changed, uh, you know, the defense – per se, it's just you got a good player starter out there playing. That, that's it. It's not like, okay, when he comes back, we're going to change all the coverages and stuff like that. It's not. It's just the guy, you know, that's why he was a starter. When you have a starter and you have a backup, the backup's usually pretty good, but he's not as good as a starter or he'd be the starter. So the fact of it is he's just playing the, the calls that we have better. Players like Tim Warren and Abdullah Anderson respond to just stepping up in place of uh, Tawan Brown. 
they're, they're doing a good job. They're, they're fighting their butt off and, and uh, stepping in there. And the good thing is, is they were progressing anyhow. They were kind of in the rotation up there anyhow, even with T, uh, TQ. And uh, so he, now they just got to play a little bit more because he's out of there. And, but I think both of them are responding very well.